I think what's so great about Father's Day is that we can celebrate not only all our earthly fathers, but our good, good father who's in heaven. And I want to charge all you dads out there today as carrying the title of a father. The way your kids perceive their father in heaven, the way they have a relationship with him, it will be largely affected of how you, their earthly father, loves them, disciplines them, guides them through life. Their, their vision of God will look a lot like you. And that's a big job to carry. Those are shoes that are so big we can't fill them. And at times we'll, we'll certainly fail. So I want to pray. Take a minute and pray for all you dads out there. Heavenly Father, thank you for being the good, good father. Thank you for, for making up where we'll fall real short. God, I, I lift all the fathers out there today, not, even, not only the ones here in this church in these walls, but on out in the community and across the world that um, they, they take a hold of their job as a father and that they, they love and, and that their relationship with their children will mimic the relationship that you have with them. That we'll look to you for advice and courage and strength and wisdom, God, that we'll pass on to our kids. It won't be ours, but it'll be yours. Father, watch you over each and every one of them. And there will be times when we crash and burn and fall way short of doing what we should do, God. And it's at those moments, God, that you, you fill in. You, you step in for us and show our children what a good, good father's like. Ah, forgive us, forgive us all as we'll fall short, God. Um, we love you and thank you so much for your son, Jesus, and what he did for our sins on the cross. It's in his name I pray today. Amen. So we find ourselves at the last piece of armor in this sermon series. And I want to quickly recap uh, each piece of armor here before we get this last one. The first piece of armor as Christians uh, who are at war with not flesh and blood, but principalities and, and spiritual powers. The first piece of armor we pick up is the belt of truth, the truth of Jesus, that he's the way and the only way, and that our life is to be centered. The, the belt goes in the middle of us, and our life's to be centered around that truth that I hope that we've all been picking that belt up and putting it on here lately. And then we put on the breastplate of righteousness. Not that, not that we're righteous at all, but that this righteousness, this breastplate, is Jesus' righteousness. And that we can hide behind it from the darts and the arrows of the evil one, and that we can share in Jesus' righteousness. And we've got this breastplate on. And we move on to the shoes of the gospel that, that get us ready, that get us prepared to, to go forward into battle, that, that we put the correct shoes, the, the right gospel, that we conform our feet to these shoes of the gospel. And then we move on to the shield of faith that we can use to deter all attacks of Satan, that it can covers us completely as a door, that it's, it's built not on our faithfulness, but on how faithful Jesus is to us. And then we pick up that helmet of salvation that we guard our mind, our thoughts, with the knowledge that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that, that we can go for knowing where we're going to be in eternity, that, that we can know this, that we don't have to wonder about this, that we don't have to guess about this. But we can put that helmet of salvation on. And all those pieces of armor that we've talked about are defensive pieces. They're, they're all to guard us, to protect us. They're all pieces of armor 
to defend against the attacks. But this piece, this piece that we pick up today that we find here in Ephesians 6, 17, it's a little bit different than all the other pieces. Paul says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The sword of the Spirit, this piece of armor is to go on the attack with. This is not to defend us against attacks, but to attack. And something about this piece of the armor you need to know is that it is sharp. This sword, the Roman soldier's sword, was very, very sharp. It was a short sword that had razor-type sharpness on it. If you was listening to Dave Markita on Forged in Fire, he would say, this sword will cut. All right? We find uh, the writer of Hebrews talking about this sword, the Word of God, in chapter 4, verse 12. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and of the spirit of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. This sword is sharp. We've probably all had a taste of that before. Whether it's in a daily devotion when you're spending time reading the Bible, or maybe it's at a sermon at a church somewhere, or it could be something you've heard through a song, but we felt this sword in discerning those thoughts, those intentions of our heart, stuff that we thought was all right or that we've justified, and then it brings on conviction. And we see that it divides us. The Word of God will divide us, and it will show that we've got two sides It'll, it'll cut us right down. It separates the joint and the marrow. Basically, it, it separates the inside of a bone from the, the bone that separates it itself, that surrounds it. That's how sharp it is, and it, it will cut. It has cut us. There's not a Christian that hasn't felt that blade before. So something when we wield a sword that is so sharp, we need to be real careful about how we use it sometimes. Sometimes we misuse it. Sometimes we like to misuse it to judge people. Sometimes we try to make its effectiveness, its sharpness come from ourselves and not the word. Because Here's another important thing about the sword. It's the sword of the Spirit. It's not like the helmet which equals salvation or the shield that equals faith. This sword is of the Holy Spirit. And it's the sword that we use, but all the power from it, all the power that it has comes from the Holy Spirit. Jesus talked about it. The Holy Spirit in John, chapter 16, verses 8 through 11. And when he comes, speaking of the Spirit, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. So this is a sword that you're going to pick up and you're going to have to use. And there'll be a time when the Holy Spirit calls this sword into use for you. But you need to let Him do the convicting with it. You need to let Him be the power behind the sword. Not not on our own effectiveness or our own thought or our own merit. Because if we do that, if, if we start using this sword in the wrong manner where we judge people, it's not going to convict. We can't convict. 
the Holy Spirit can. We'll just usually make angry and upset and put divisions between us and other people. But when it's used at the right time, in the right way, there's not a sword sharper, more effective that you'll ever find. Once again, this is a weapon for offense, not defense. Paul used a word in the Greek here, rhema. Where you see in Ephesians 6, 6, 17 where it says the word of God. Most of the time it's always logos that's used here. But rhema means something a little bit different. Not just the written down word of God, but this is the proclaimed word of God. So if you're going to use this sword, it's not just, here's my Bible, here's my sword, find it for yourself. You've got to be able to speak this, you've got to proclaim this, you've got to, you've got to know how to use this sword. This is, a, this is a weapon that's not effective when you just leave it sitting on your coffee table. This is not a weapon that is effective when you don't take it to work with you. This is not a weapon to not be used at home with the family. But this is a weapon you need to carry on with you. And it's, it's, it's something that you've got to speak. If you want to swing the sword, you've got to learn how to speak the word. And you may get the idea that, well, this is for the preachers and the elders, and and this is not a, a weapon for everybody, but here, this is the Christian's armor that he picks up. This is everybody's armor to put on. This is everybody's supposed to pick up the sword of the Spirit. It's each and every Christian's job to know how to swing it. To take it out and then get on the offensive with it. Cameron's going to get up and pass some of these things out. I want to equip you to be able to use this sword. On this, you find this neat little bookmark is 10, 10 scriptures, 10 pieces of the sword that everybody should know. And there's more than this. There's more than this that you need to understand and know and have the concept of. But this is 10 pretty vital ones. And we're going to talk a little bit about this. And this is something with the sword. And we don't see too many people carrying books around with them all the time anymore. But this is one way that you can carry a sword. And you're certainly not going to memorize the whole Bible and know how to use it. But what's the one thing that every person carries on them? They can't even hardly go in a swimming pool without this on them anymore. Phone, you bet. I can't leave. You get like anxiety, right? When you leave the house and your phone's at home on the charger, turn that truck around. We won't be able to make it. All right. But one way you can carry the sword is on your phone. There are so many Bible apps, and you can get this sword and put it and carry it with you at all time. If, if you've got the U version of the Bible app, and you've got, if you went to the event today, and you save that event, these 10 scriptures are right there. You may not always carry this little bookmark on you, But you can save that because you're going to need these at times. You're going to need these not only because somebody needs to hear them, but at times because you're going to get attacked. And the sword's for fighting back, right? Carry these with you. And even better than, than having them on a phone or a book, if you like to run everywhere, go everywhere with the Bible on your side, that's there's nothing wrong with that at all. I'm I applaud you for that. That's cool. Know them in your head. Know them in your head. 
Because these attacks come at the most uncertain times. If you know these scriptures, though, you will be ready for those attacks. Not only to defend, but to go on the offensive. One of these screen. What about how often in life do we search for how we should put our priorities? How do we organize our priorities? How should we do that? We, we, organ, we suffer from this all the time. What should I put first in my life? Should I put my kids? Should I, I put my job? Should I put this? If you've got the sword in the form of Matthew 6, 33, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's where our priorities should lie. And then all the other things will be added on to you. That's an important piece of the sword to carry with you. Um, What about, you ever have doubts at times? You ever get attacked with the fact whether God actually loves you or not? Paul says in Romans 8, 38 through 39, for those moments when you're feeling depressed and alone and you have no one here on this earth to love you and you're wondering and and contemplating thoughts that you never should and trying to figure out if God loves you, Paul says in Romans 8, 38, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you know this scripture at those dark times and dark moments when you're isolated and feel all along, you can pull your sword out and run the devil through, knowing that there's nothing in this world that can separate you from God's love. Suicide rate continues to climb and climb and climb, and I wonder how many people would not go through with it if they had that sword in that moment when they're trying to make a decision. If they knew how much God loved them. What about when we're faced with decisions and we don't know what to do? How can we figure out whether we should do that or not? Matthew 22, 37 through 39, Jesus sets out the simple commands that we should do in all our life. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second one is like, love your neighbor as yourself. When you're faced with a difficult decision what to do, you can find your answer right there. Will this help me love God? Will this show that I love God more? Will this show that I love my neighbor? Or is it going to take me the other way? What about when we're examining our life? Is my actions right? Am I living as a Christian? Galatians 5, through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Am I living my life to the Spirit? Well, is this action going to produce love? Will it produce joy? Is this going to increase my patience? Make me more kind? Is this good for me? Is this showing my faithfulness to God? Is this gentle? Does this have self-control in it? You want to try and find out how your actions, where they're pointing you at? Know that scripture. Anything else is to the flesh. What about love? Seems to be a big question that we have in this country in this day and age. What is love? Is feeling a love? 
How do we show love? It's pretty simple. Corinthians 13, Paul tells us, <clears throat> Paul tells us who was powered by the Holy Spirit to write these words down. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. Always perseveres. You want to know what love is or what love's not? Pull this sword out. It tells us right here. Love, it don't say nothing about feelings or attractions or, or anything else. But it says everything about it's, it's kind. No envy. It don't boast. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It don't keep records of wrong. It rejoices with the truth. What about if you're trying to really figure out if you love Jesus or not? John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, Jesus says to his disciples. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You want to know if you really love Jesus? Just divide your life up by that scripture. See where that takes you. What about when we're tempted? What about when nobody else is around and them temptations come calling? Jesus faced the same thing. Forty days in the wilderness, fasting with no food, and here comes the devil to tempt him. Tempts him three times, and what does Jesus do every time? He runs him through with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. Whatever temptation you face, there's been, it's common. You're not the only one. Lots of people are faced with that same temptation, that same heaviness, that same weight. A lot of them say no to it. So can you. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Anytime you're tempted, God's not allowing more to be put upon your shoulders than what you can handle. It may seem like it. It may seem there's no way that you can do anything but give in to that temptation. But if you'll just wait, he says he will show you a way out. You need to know this. Because if you know this, when them temptations come, you will be able to fight them off and stand until God releases you from that, shows you a way out from that temptation. You don't have to be controlled by any temptation in life. You don't know if you can stand it anymore? We'll pull out Isaiah 40, 31. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I don't care how far you are to the end of your rope. Read Isaiah 40, 31, and it's almost like you've been lifted up and you've got a new grasp, a new breath of air, you can stand a little bit longer. What about worry? Anxiousness, something that, that we all face at tons of times, and it, it has been proven to be bad for our health, decreased life, cause hair loss, among other things.
Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God. He says, don't worry. Don't worry about anything. I take care of the clothes on the birds. I feed them in the field. Just bring it to me. Just bring it to me. You don't have to have, live a life that is controlled and guided by worry and anxiousness. There's no need for that in a Christian's life. Take it to God. He's going to take care of it. In times of tribulation, when we're being tried by the world and don't know what to do, John 16, Jesus says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. What trial or tribulation can we not face when we know that we're in Jesus and that he's overcame this world? That we can put ourselves in him, that we don't have to face this, that he's already faced it and won. The sword is important. It's probably the most difficult weapon, difficult piece of the armor. If you want to go ahead and make your way up, Dylan, that any of us use. Because it takes some work. It takes some work to know this and live this out. Not only to read it or hear it, but to let it seek in our brains all the way down to our hearts. Because we've got to have it with us at all times. And it's something you can take with you when you're out on the offensive. And probably one of the most important, you want to put a sharp edge on your sword? I would say you need to know the Romans' road to salvation. Because it is a few very simple scriptures that can be applied to any situation in life. It can be applied to people at work. It can be applied to at home, when your family, when your kids. What are you going to do when your kid comes to you and wants to know about being saved? Oh, wait a minute. We'll go to church next Sunday. No, you need to know this. So you, the person that they trust the most, dads, the one who's supposed to image God, the good, good father, you need to have this down. And it's applicable to any situation, even right here in this church. Romans 1.6 says there's, there's none righteous. No, not one. And that, that right there, you look up here and you think, I'm righteous, I'm not. The only righteousness you see in me is the breastplate, the Jesus that I'm putting on. I, not, not even me, not even a preacher, not any of the preachers, not Billy Graham, not Greg Laurie, not Craig Rochelle, or, or whatever preacher you might think is righteous and lives a good life and is so deserving to be righteous. None of us, none of us are righteous. No, not one. Not only me, but you. Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. All have sinned. Not, it don't matter what we dress up and how we look like when we come in this church and we put on our Sunday's best and we all look good and like, like we're, we're good, holy people who act right. No, you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We're all sinners sitting in here. We, our heart, when we've been in those places, those black, dark places, we have sinned. Each and every one of us, no matter how morally good life we've led, we've broken God's law at one time or another. Even if it's just in our heart, it, maybe it wasn't in our outward actions, but in our heart we've lusted, lusted we've been angry, we're guilty of adultery, and we're guilty of murder. If ever, even for one little second, you've held that in your heart, you are a sinner. 
And that's not just to make mistake. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. That's not just an accident. Mistakes are not planned out. Accidents are not repeated over and over and over and over. That is sin. Try to camouflage it all you want, but it's sin, and the wages for that is death. That breaks your relationship with God. You're guilty of death, and that punishment will be carried out. And I'm not talking about physical death, but I'm talking about eternal death. Condemnation in hell. Each and every one of us is guilty of that. And that is sin, and it's black, and it's horrible, and it hurts. And I hate to think that I'm a sinner, but I am a sinner. And that I deserve death. We deserve the cross. We deserve what happened to Jesus. But... The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And as guilty as sin as we are, we can have a gift given to us. Because Romans 5, 8, while we were still yet sinners, God loved us and sent a son to die for us. And Romans 10, 9, that with the heart you will believe and with the mouth you will confess your sins and that everyone who does that, everyone can be saved. And when Peter preached the first sermon recorded in the new early church, and he preached it to a bunch of people that was guilty for killing Jesus, for sending to that cross. And he told them, he said, you're basically a bunch of sinners. You killed the Messiah. And it was, they said, the Bible tells us it was recorded that they was cut to the heart by the sword. And they said, what must we do to be saved? He said, repent and be baptized. Will you pray with me today, Heavenly Father? I ask that you equip each and every one who leaves here today with a sword, but they'll have a new burning desire in their hearts and their minds to go and, and learn Romans Road or some of these scriptures down or the many more that can guide us in life that we can hide your word in our hearts so that we may not sin against you, that we can help others to find salvation, that you can use us as a warrior out in your army to defeat the evil one, God. And if there's anybody here that's been cut to the heart today by your word that, that their sin has been exposed and they don't know you, they haven't trusted you, they haven't confessed with your, your mouth or believed in your heart that you died on the cross for their sins, God, that they would, they would come forward today, that they would meet you right now in this time of invitation. Father, forgive us for when we fall short. We love you with all of our heart.